Welcome back. And Mitch, so great to see you. Good to see you, Tam. And we have a really terrific guest today, Jody Burns, the program director right at uh, Denver Children's Advocacy Center. Yes, thank you. Welcome to the show. So great to have you thank here. Thank you. You know, I love doing work with you guys. I've tapped into you for so many resources for various stories, but a lot of people don't really know what you do. Can you kind of give us a, a broad overview of what the uh, center does? Sure. Denver Children's Advocacy Center is a nonprofit agency, and we have a continuum of care. We offer prevention services where we have staff that go into the schools and educate children, parents, and teachers about safety. Uh, we also have a forensic interviewing program and an assessment and treatment program uh, with therapy services available to family and children. And you've been there about five years? Yes. I imagine it's a very interesting, wonderful place to work. It at. absolutely is. Yeah. Mitch, let's talk a little bit about how this center interfaces with the DA's office. How does it work? Well, they interface with the children that are the victims of these horrible crimes. and. They interface in a lot of different ways. I've been in the DA's office for a long time, and before the Children's Advocacy Center was here, I was here in the DA's office, and you'd have a child that was sexually abused, or you would have a child that witnessed their mother get killed in a domestic violence, a young child, and they'd be sitting in the same interrogation room that uh, a suspect would be sitting in. Sometimes they find a little bit higher chair for them to sit on or, or some uh, you know some uh, old stuffed animal for them to hold but it was a detective that would interview them old homicide detective or a sex assault detective on a sex assault on ch a child detective and they didn't have the training or the expertise and so what would happen was the children would just clam up they wouldn't talk they wouldn't tell us what would happen and so we really started to work together to develop this forensic interviewing program. The Children's Advocacy Center came on board, became our partners in doing that. And then we interface with them in court, of course, because sometimes children, when they get on the witness stand, uh, they, they will testify, but then the forensic examiner can testify about the interview, about what they saw, what they observed. Of course, they can never say they believe the child. Uh, that's something that's prohibited by the rules. But because of our child hearsay rules in Colorado, we're able to get the statements that the child made to the examiner before the jury. And we could never do that. Well, we could do it before, but if the child just shut down mm -hmm. and didn't talk to the detective, then we never had the statement to begin with. So we interface with them when it's time for them to come in and testify on our behalf or on the behalf of the child and behalf of the people of Denver. So we'll get to forensic uh, interviews in just a moment, but first, Jody, talk about the collaboration and the different partners that you have and how important it is to, to have that kind of team approach. Collaboration is critical when we're investigating child abuse cases because the more we collaborate, the more effective our response is to the child abuse allegations. There are several partners in our multidisciplinary team um, to include my agency, um, the Denver DA's office, Denver Police Department, Denver Health Medical Center and Denver Human Services. And we also have victim advocates and mental health professionals that are part of that team. And so each of them have their specific areas. Can you give me an example of, or two of what somebody does? What, what mm -hmm. I envision is what used to be is, as Mitch was saying, you have a, you know, a, a salty, maybe a salty <laughs> detective or sergeant mm -hmm. sitting with the child, and then that child has to tell their story to another individual. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, retelling the story m might get to be fairly traumatic on top of the trauma that they probably already had. Sure. So when we investigate an abuse of allegations, um, all of the above mentioned members are there and we share all of our information. So by collaborating, we're able to share our reports, share our knowledge, our skills, our, our all of our expertise. our expertise. Right. And so that when I have my responsibility of specializing in my role, the rest of the team has their responsibility in specializing in their roles, whether it be prosecuting, um, investigating, assess, assessing safety of the children. And so we interview children um, at the advocacy center, which is a very child friendly setting. We have tables that are child sized tables <laughs> and um, we're just able to build that rapport and are trained to ask 
the questions that are needed for the investigation. I've been there a couple of times and they are the little, little chairs and, and tables and lots of toys. And the idea, of course, I imagine is to make the child feel comfortable and safe and that this is a, a child's place, not a place for a bunch of grown-ups. Yes, and then I think when a child feels safe, the parents are also feeling much more at ease as well. Can you get... And, and another thing that they do is that they record these these mm -hmm. interviews. They record, uh, they video them. And so the, in a child, especially in a child sex assault situation, uh, the defense is always, this child made this up, or the person that they reported it to has an ax to grind or made it up or, or that type of thing. So by recording their methodology, what they did, how that interview went, went a jury can sit and watch and say, well, this person didn't didn't prompt this child to say these things. This person didn't do anything that was inappropriate. And then to also have them, the experts that they are, testify at the way they did the interview. This is why I did this. This is why we did it here. All of those kinds of things. And then it just makes sense to the jury. Those allegations that this is trumped up by the mother or by the you know, somebody that it's a divorce or, or that kind of thing. That's the defenses in these cases. So to have an expert that can get up and describe it, show their methodology, methodology, and then to actually have a video of the statement of the child is critical for us in presenting the case in court. And I imagine having it videotaped, it, it uh, eliminates the number of times the child has to repeat the story. Yes, and that is certainly one of our main goals is to have the child tell their story only one time because that's less traumatizing. And then that recording is the best evidence of what the child says and also reflects their demeanor and the spontaneity of the statement and how it was, um, how it was disclosed. So let's talk a little bit more about the forensic interviewing then. How, what does that really mean? How, what does that look like? So a forensic interview is an interview that is designed to be fact-finding and it is conducted in a child-friendly um, manner. So we're very developmentally appropriate with our questions that we ask. Um, we are in a child-friendly setting and we're very neutral and ask non-leading questions. It, it, are there different types of questions for different age groups of, of young people that you would work with? Well, in general, we're going to get less information um, from a younger child than we are from an older child just due to where they are developmentally. And mm -hmm. so we're going to gear our questions uh, simpler and more direct with the younger child. And we know that our time frame is going to be shorter with them as they have a shorter attention span. I imagine uh, like watching on Law and Order and then you have the child draw the picture and where did the person hurt you, that sort of thing. Is it that kind of basic conversation with the little one? We do because the goal of a forensic interview is to elicit as much information from a child in their own words. Um, again, using non-leading techniques. Mm -hmm. And so drawings are often generated because that also supports the evidence and supports collaboration for what allegations have been made. And so with this collaboration and the, the team approach, is there a way to measure how successful that has been? Is, are there measurable outcomes that you can say, well, this was something that really worked in this particular case and many cases with our young children? Well, there are a lot, is a lot of research on the CAC model and the majority of the country is adopting to that CAC model and the multidisciplinary approach. And it certainly is less traumatic for families and for children. Um, one, because we are in a child-friendly setting, we are conducting forensic interviews, we're lessening the amount of time that, um, if more effective, quicker responses to allegations. You know, it's as simple as, I remember when the equipment that was being used at Human Services wasn't up to speed. So the videos were not good. And my people started to say, you know, great interview, really lousy video. It's not helping us in court. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you ask about success, you know, I don't, I don't know the data. I don't have a report I can give you. But I can tell you something as simple as the video breaking down or the video not being good impacts our ability to hold these people that are molesting our children, people that are sexually assaulting these kids accountable. So we know it was a good interview, it just doesn't, it doesn't play well on the video because they were using inferior equipment. 
That's not the advocacy center's fault, but that would be the kind of complaint I would get. We need to get them new equipment. We need to work on this because these are so critical to our cases. So in that regard, I can tell you there is an incredible success rate when we have a forensic interviewer that is an expert than when the days when we didn't have them. So the forensic interview process is pretty important? It is an important part of the piece of the investigation because it's the chance where the child is talking about what has happened to them or what they've seen or what they've heard. You know, the center does a lot more though too. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that they are one of our partners in the Rosandum Center. Oh, we know right. there's going to be a lot of kids that have been exposed to a lot of horrible things, maybe not abuse themselves, mm -hmm. but we also know that people that abuse their spouses, abuse their children, mm -hmm. they abuse their animals, they abuse ev their abusers. Mm -hmm. And so we brought them in and when we always talk about all of our partnerships and, and who's involved there, they've been critical in that. They're helping us develop how we'll respond when somebody walks through the door and has a child and the child needs to be interviewed, that type of thing. The Children's Advocacy Center is a big partner in the Rosandum Center. That's really great to know. And I, uh, w before we started uh, the show, you were talking about how you hope to be able to continue to work with the kids rather than mm -hmm. sort of get up in some of the management piece of it. Why is that important to you? You know, working with the kids in that frontline interview is is just the passion and is part of why we do the work that we do and to remember that every day. I will always remember a case where I interviewed a little girl and it was on a Friday night. Um, she was brought to the center by the police and social workers because her stepfather was sexually abusing her in the home mm -hmm. and we're in a child friendly setting um, but during the break that I took she drew me a picture and all it said was you rock you're awesome thank you for listening and it was just hearts and flowers and so it's just a symbol that it's not a we don't make it a traumatic experience for kids and they're oftentimes relieved that they have an outlet to tell what's happened to them you know we've been talking about sexual assault against uh, children uh, what uh, do you also investigate and interview children about other types of abuses we do, and in the past five years, we've certainly seen an increase in interviewing children with severe physical abuse allegations, mm -hmm. um, children that have been witness to homicide of a parent or of a sibling, and certainly children who've been witness to some sort of violence in their home, whether it be between parents or witnessing um, a sibling be physically abused. And is the process then sort of the same doing the forensic interviews as you would do for uh, sexual abuse? Yes. You know, I think that people need to understand that we find kids in some of the most horrible settings. Mm -hmm. We had three little boys that basically could not talk. They grunted to each other. They were living in a place that, you know, bedding, did you guys take the bedding? I know that one of my deputies asked the police that. They said there was no bedding mm -hmm. to take. I mean, these little boys were hanging out windows and that type of thing and so the police were called. When they got there they couldn't even communicate. And so you call in experts to help you get the information that you need from children like that. Now that's an extreme example but you know they've been subject to abuse. They don't trust people. They don't trust the police. When they have somebody that is an expert that knows how to deal with them based on their age, based on their, under, their situation, mm -hmm. then we get we get the story of what occurred. And I, I wonder if you get um, grandparents or other relatives or maybe neighbors that contact you and say, we've got you know, these children next door or in our school that we know are being abused and physically, sexually. Do you refer them to Jody's organization? Well, usually if it's, if it's something that's going ongoing, we refer it to the police or mm -hmm. to human services, and that's what somebody should do. But I have had, for instance, a woman up at the Capitol who I know came to me and said, you know, my daughter suffered this, and she's really having these hard things. It's been years ago. It's been dealt with, uh, but she needs help. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, you need to go to the Children's Advocacy Center. It wouldn't be a forensic interview, mm -hmm. but this center does so much for children in our community. It is such an important part of our community. And you know, the interesting thing is I saw her a few months later 
And you know, she was in school, so they let her come in on Saturdays. They worked around her schedule. Uh, her grandmother had to bring her. And she said, oh, she is just doing so well. Thank you so much for bringing her in. And they weren't a family that could pay. They weren't a family that, that had a lot of money. And I think people watching the show need to understand that this is a nonprofit mm -hmm. that helps children. And so if anybody is interesting, interested in supporting a nonprofit that makes a difference in lives of kids, that is local, that helps us here in Denver, the Children's Advocacy Center, I'm sure would take your check. <laughs> I mean, and that's a real thing they face every day to keep their doors open. We have contracts with them. They have a contract with the city and the police department. But, you know, that comes up. And sometimes there's worries about how much money they're going to get for these interviews, all of that. But the real facts are that people that want to support their fine work can certainly step up and do that. And, and every time I go over, it's not that often, it's once every couple of years when I'm mm -hmm. looking for ex experts who can talk on, on this topic. And your campus is just like a really safe place. And it is a campus. Can you talk to me, talk to us about the buildings that, you know, came from mm -hmm. one small area uh, near the downtown area to where you are located now? Yes, and so we have grown to a three campus building off of 22nd and Federal, and we've renovated old Victorian homes that were dilapidated prior to our um, obtaining them. And so we have one house that is all for assessment treatment for therapy, and then we have a house um, that houses the forensic interview program and the prevention program. And just a year ago, we're able to open a medical um, office right there on campus as well. Oh, wow. And so what does that medical office then do? Do you? So the children that come to our agency um, are can have medicals as well. And so oftentimes when there are allegations of sexual abuse or even physical abuse um, or witness to violence, um, medicals are necessary. And oftentimes children have worries about being hurt that they don't want to talk about and they need a medical doctor to talk about any worries that they might have and it's just another service that we offer now. And it's that collaboration. So Dr. Wells from Denver Health, mm -hmm. who does our child abuse cases and testifies for us all the time, she goes over to the Children's Advocacy Center and uses that facility there. And the last time I was there, they were opening this beautiful playground in the back mm -hmm. for those kids that are there knowing full well that this is hard to talk about, physically abused, there may be medical issues, but it's a place where it's safe for these kids, they can go out and they can play. Federal Bur Boulevard used to be one of the most beautiful streets in the entire city of Denver. It was a boulevard mm -hmm. and had beautiful homes, that type of thing. And now when you drive by Fed on Federal and you drive by their facility, it's just, it almost, it almost glows, it's mm -hmm. so, beautiful they've done such a great job and I've I was in the first building when they put up the first wall and I've been there every time they've opened something else and done a great job there but I think it also has kind of brought that part of federal back mm -hmm. to really what it used to be in the grand old days of Federal Boulevard so they have done a great job in that part of the city in revitalizing that not only the great work they do in that place well, and I imagine not only do you work with uh, the children that are the victims, but maybe their siblings and other family members. How does that all come together? And is it difficult to work with the rest of the family? Are they cooperative? Maybe not if they're the abuser, right? So how does that work out? Well, we are always open to working with siblings. Um, and oftentimes, siblings do need some sort of services if we have a primary victim there. Um, and every family reacts differently. And one thing that is unique about our center is that we do not allow offenders on campus. So if a parent or a caregiver is the alleged offender, they're not allowed on our campus. That's uh. one part that makes our campus safe for and, children. Because you don't want the same situation that you used to have years ago right. where you had the suspect alongside the child who's trying to tell his or her story. Right, or in the room next door and the child knows that their perpetrators in the room next door and might be going home with them right after the interview. And I imagine all this effort sort of helps minimize the overall trauma that the child has already, you know, encountered and suffered through. And that's another benefit of the CAC because all of our partners respond to the child and family. And it used to be that a child might have to go to the hospital and then to 
social services and then to be interviewed and then to the police station and this is kind of a one-stop shop for the child and the family. We have medical on site, we have the forensic interviews on site, caseworkers, detectives all meet with them and we have the luxury because we also have assessment and treatment that we can offer therapy services right then and there if, if need be and most families are really pleased with our our their experience there and they want to come back there for therapy as well. That separation is critical. We had it just not all that long ago, two little kids that watched their younger sibling abused to the point where the baby was killed. Mm -hmm. They were our eyewitnesses. There was a grandfather that was very, very upset and due to manpower and some problems with the police department, the interview was going on at police headquarters. You guys were there doing the interview but it was going on there. This grandfather got very upset out in the hall. And he started to get very vocal and you can see the kids start to shut down. They could hear it. And so this separation is critical. And I gotta tell you, we get, I get very irritated when I hear that these kids were not taken to this facility where they would be isolated from that kind of influence. Now, that, um, that grandfather was getting into a physical altercation with someone else mm -hmm. in the hallway, but it had an impact on our ability to find out what those kids saw, find out what important information they had that, w that is necessary to know. Mm -hmm. When we have a dead baby, we have somebody that was abused by the person that was taking care of all three of these kids. So I'm, I, I, when we talk about how important the work here is, when you actually see it like that, you know it's critical and we have to keep it going. Well, and here we are in the 21st century, 2015, and we're still talking about child abuse. Like, haven't we evolved as human beings yet? Are you seeing a larger number of children becoming victims? And, and if so, is that just because we just have more people or kind of put into context where, where we are and, and where we need to go? We have conducted probably about, we do about 500 forensic interviews per year. And I certainly don't think it's because child abuse is going away, mm -hmm. but there are a lot more prevention efforts and programs in the city. And I think there's also a heightened awareness um, of what's going on. And we want neighbors to call in when they see children hanging out of windows. And mm -hmm. we just want the community to be aware and always call and report your concerns. And that's, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind is that the DA's office, police officers, professionals can't be everywhere all the time. So you really must rely on the public quite a bit to be the eyes and ears of the community, especially for young people. Yes. Not only the community, but the schools. I mean, we have mandatory reporting. We've talked yeah, about right. that on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it's a school teacher that notices a bruise or notices something like that, mm -hmm. or that the child will outcry to and say, this is what's happening to me at home. And then they have a responsibility to call law enforcement, to call human services. And then we can bring this entire victim focused, and that's what this is, mm -hmm. collaboration together to make sure that we are treating these victims with the dignity and respect that they deserve, even though they're children. And so that's why I'm proud to be part of this collaboration. I want to thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Glad Jody. To so great it. to meet you, and thanks for all the great work that you do with the Denver Ad Children's Denver Advocacy Center. Thank you. <laughs> and you can find out more online, of course, on that spectacular group of, our, of people doing really wonderful work. Thanks for being with us. That's it for this edition of Dialogue Denver DA. We'll see you next time.